Aloha, everyone. My name is Scott Splina. I'm the vice president of the senior council division. And this, this afternoon, um, I have the great pleasure of introducing Nicholas Banos. Um, Nick is an Alzheimer Association regional coordinator, and he's also worked um, with the Office of Aging, specifically with their Aging and Disability Resource Center, the ADRC team. Uh, prior to joining the association in October 2020, uh, Nick worked with the Hawaii Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Care Provider in Hilo. He volunteers as a member of the Community Action Network and Advanced Healthcare Planning Committees of Community First, a nonprofit organization geared towards improving health on the island of Oahu, uh, on um, Hawaii Island, I apologize. He also assists Communities First team as a consultant for Healthcare Workforce Collaborative Project, a community-based initiative to build solutions to the gaps in healthcare on Hawaii Island. Nick's professional experience is supplemented by his personal caregiving experience with his grandfather who lived with Alzheimer's disease in his final years and his 99 year old grandmother who is living with dementia. Nick is currently working on his dissertation as a candidate in Concordia University, Wisconsin's Doctor of Education program. Nick, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks Scott for having me and thanks Desmond for setting us all up today. So. Um, I know I've seen some of you at my last time. I don't remember when it was last, but it seems like it was kind of a while ago. But, um, you know, I'm so excited to be here today to talk about what I'm calling the era of treatment. Actually, the Alzheimer's Association, we're coining this period of our lives as the era of treatment. Uh, so I'm going to share some updates today on some of the work we're doing. I'm going to start with some of the basics. But as uh, first, as Scott said, you know, I've been working in this field with elderly and caregivers for 14 years yeah, going on, this is my 14th year. And even though I wasn't with the association in my earlier years, it's just the families I've worked with, a lot of them are affected by dementia or Alzheimer's disease in some way. So, you know, it's, it's such a blessing to be at the association for the last three years and really putting my professional background together with my, my personal background with my family. So happy to be here. Uh, I'm the regional coordinator here on Hawaii Island, born and raised in Hilo. Um, if you're familiar, I'm living, I live in Waiakeuka, so that's a little bit on the upside, uh, but I cover the entire island, so a lot of driving around. Uh, my office is basically the back of my Chevy SUV, and uh, this is my third bedroom here. So really excited to be here today and share some updates. So let's get started really quickly. Our vision at the association is a world without Alzheimer's disease and all other dementia. Now we've added that last part, all other dementia, um, because Alzheimer's is just one type. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And our mission is to lead the way to end Alzheimer's and other dementia by accelerating global research, driving risk reduction, early detection and maximizing quality care and support. So we'll touch on each of those pieces as we go through today. Now I wanted to start with some statistics from right here in Hawaii. There are an estimated 100,000 folks living with Alzheimer's disease in the state of Hawaii. Uh, it doesn't sound like much relative to the population, but this is an estimate. And a lot of people actually never get that diagnosis and that's unfortunate. So I think the statistic is, I think only 60% of folks who end up having Alzheimer's disease actually get a formal diagnosis. So that, oh wait, it's the other way around, 40%. So the other 60%, they're just living it out. Some more numbers here, of course, this shouldn't be a surprise as our population of baby boomers gets older, uh, there will be an increase in the number of people living with Alzheimer's disease in the next uh, few years or so. So uh, that all leads up to some other things like this. Basically, there are 60,000 estimated caregivers taking care of those folks with Alzheimer's or other dementia. Now, that is unpaid caregivers, meaning informal supports. Uh, in our field, we call informal supports either family, friends, neighbors, church members, anybody that's not getting paid or is doing this as a job. Uh, there are home care agencies that you can, of course, pay to do this, but that 60,000 is that's not them. It's family, friends, and everybody else. So what they look at is how is this, what is the value of this? And that is the estimate, $1.9 billion of unpaid care. So if you were to hire all these folks and pay them, that is the price tag. That doesn't come without, you know, some negative parts. Of course, in Hawaii, especially, we do like to take care. I think it's natural for us to want to take care of our ohana as we, as they age, you know, we honor our kupuna and our elders. 
But on the right side there, you can see that it does take a toll on the caregivers. Almost half of caregivers have a chronic condition of their own. So it makes caregiving just that much more difficult. And as you can see, depression and general physical health problems also affect caregivers. It's not uncommon to actually have a case where a caregiver gets sick and goes down first. I actually know of a case where, unfortunately, his son was taking care of mom. Uh, very shame about the whole thing. I'm not gonna, he didn't wanna talk to anybody. He ended up having, I think, a heart attack while he was caring for his mom and they both passed away. So, you know, that's very dire, but that is the reality. So I just wanna point that out. Some more stats here, why this is important, mostly for those bottom two members there, the cost of care for people with Alzheimer's disease. That Medicaid number there, $240 million spent in the state of Hawaii. A lot of that is likely long-term care, so skilled nursing facilities and such. The Medicare there, a lot of times folks are not, you know, Medicare doesn't cover long-term care, but there are a lot of hospitalizations, as you see there, a lot of emergency department revisits and uh, visits and revisits. So it is a very expensive disease. And on average, when, you know, somebody gets diagnosed, they could live maybe four to eight years from that diagnosis. However, I'm pretty sure that number is outdated because people are getting diagnosed a lot earlier. But if you think about even on the far end, eight years, that's eight years of, you know, possibly very expensive care. So all of this, I'm trying to build a picture as to why this really, why our work is really important, not just here in Hawaii, but across the nation and the world. I should mention that the Alzheimer's Association is national. Uh, we are based out of Chicago and uh, we are, I am part of the Aloha chapter. So our office is in Honolulu. If you're familiar with the gold bond building across um, Salt de Kaka'ako, that is where our office is currently. Uh, but the neighbor islands, we work out of our homes and our vehicles and wherever else we can find space. So I wanna do some ground setting here. I, I cover this, I try to cover this in every presentation. So dementia is a syndrome. Uh, we often get that question, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? So Alzheimer's disease, as you see under that umbrella, is one type or one cause of dementia. And if you see in the umbrella, it might be hard to read with the colors going on there. Uh, we're really good at branding. Uh, dementia is an umbrella term that we use to describe a range of symptoms associated with cognitive impairment. So Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia in a way. I think the reason why, though, we see those terms interchanged is because it is the most prevalent. Now, with testing, um, you, it's not uncommon for somebody to have more than one type of dementia, especially those first two there. Uh, my grandfather had both Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Uh, vascular dementia is common because it's associated with brain injury due to stroke or uh, force injury to the brain. So, you know, as science is going forward, it wasn't too long ago that the only way to tell if he had Alzheimer's was to wait till the person passed away and look inside his brain. So of course, uh, that is not the case now. Okay, uh, I did wanna mention, if you have questions, you can use the question and answer function. And I know Desmond will be helping me to look at those. If there's something that comes up uh, that you wanna talk about right now, uh, definitely put those questions in the Q&A or chat. And I, if not, we will wait to the end of the presentation. Now, specifically Alzheimer's disease, you might, maybe you don't know neuritic plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, but plaques and tangles are the terms that we commonly use to describe what's happening in somebody's brain when they have Alzheimer's disease. So those pictures look a little nondescript. I, I mean, I can barely make them out what they are, but what you really have to know is that these proteins are floating around, getting stuck to one another and blocking the signals from firing across your, your, across your brain, basically. So that is what's, that's what's causing the memory loss and, and the behavior changes very much associated with Alzheimer's disease. On the right side there, fancy word, neurodegeneration cortical atrophy just means that your brain cells are dying and your brain matter is basically fading away. So there are physical, actual physical changes to your brain when you have Alzheimer's disease. On the right side, very much smaller. A lot of the pukas there, you see those gaps are where the cells have been dying. Um, and so that's what happens with Alzheimer's disease. Again, remember there are different types of dementia, but this is specifically Alzheimer's disease. This is really something we wanna, we wanna look at. And, oh, this is something we're looking at a lot nowadays uh, because a lot of the treatments that I'll talk about in a bit 
are most effective in that orange section there, which is labeled MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. But let's just start from the left. So somebody could have the biological, you know, those plaques and tangles could be happening, but they're not showing any signs of behavior change or forgetfulness or, you know, memory challenges yet, but they could still have the biology happening in their brain. So we call those folks asymptomatic. They're fine. No changes. They're going about their life. No problem. Where mild cognitive impairment or MCI is so important is because that's typically when people would say, I think something's wrong. I need to go see a doctor. However, that is also when people start to not talk about it. You know, they start, it's shame or they don't, they don't, you know, they don't know. Maybe they don't know. You know, a lot of folks that have end up having Alzheimer's disease, the changes are not noticed by themselves. It's noticed by somebody else, whether it's their spouse, children, neighbor, friend. It's usually something that they don't say, wake up and say, I think something's wrong with me. Now, with education, though, we're working on that. Basically, if you are feeling some symptoms, which I'll cover in a bit, that are possibly mild cognitive impairment or MCI, then start going to the doctor and asking questions already. Um, I think one of the main reasons also is because it might be something else. So uh, as you go through that orange stage there, though, that's where a lot of the treatments are that are coming out are very much the most effective. Now in that purple section there, that is our typical progression of Alzheimer's disease. As you see there, we describe it as dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, um, mild to severe. And I have another slide here. Uh, again, this is intended to just be a very broad guide. It is not intended to be a very clean cut. For the most part, people will flow one way uh, through these changes. Uh, you're not going to just wake up and say, today I'm only middle stage. No, you will probably have some overlap as you progress through the disease. Uh, I want to also say that if you go to, a, you know, certain doctors use different scales, they might have, I think one of them I heard is like 12 different type. I mean, 12 different stages and so a patient might tell me, I'm a stage seven. I don't know what that means. Um, there's one, I think somebody said like a 20 point. I was like, I don't know points. So in any case, the main thing to know is that it does progress from the left to the right. And as you can see, there's some of the examples of what kind of changes happen. So as you heard in my bio intro, uh, my grandmother is 99. She just turned 99 last week. Um, so she is actually in the middle stage because right now she can't really speak. A lot of it also has to do with her hearing. Um, sometimes English is not her best, so she might throw a Japanese word here or there. Uh, she definitely has behavioral changes for sure. She's, you know, she was always pretty to herself, but, you know, she does have some bouts of anxiety in a sense is what it looks like. Forgetfulness, her short-term memory is basically zero. Um, she can meet you for the first time um, multiple times in an hour. And um, sleep patterns, she does have problems going to sleep, waking up in the middle of the night and starting to get ready for the day. Uh, you know, so she's not really sure what time of day it is sometimes. So that's where I feel she is right now. Now this is where it's super exciting in the field of Alzheimer's uh, research and science. Uh, let's go through this really quickly. Um, 1906 was when Alzheimer's disease was first described. If you can guess what the doctor's name is, you're right on. Um, but it is, his name is Dr. Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer. But anyway, as you see here from the 90s through to 2014, we had a bunch of treatments that were just for symptoms. So these, again, very similar to the treatments that are, that are newer, are most effective when they are given or prescribed and taken earlier on, earlier versus, you know, just like how we saw in that middle stage. Uh, for example, in a middle stage, you probably wouldn't start somebody on these. A lot of times doctors will try to do it. Um, and, you know, I've heard mixed things from families. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the easiest way to think about this is that these drugs don't treat those plaques and tangles at all. What they do is, uh, maybe I'll give you an example. Let's say you hit your head and you crack your skull and you have a headache. You can take painkillers to get rid of some of the pain, but it you still have that crack in your brain, I mean, in your skull, right? So that's kind of what this, these medications do. Uh, they just very much symptomatic working with what's in there that's still intact. Um, and, you know, some of these are, I feel like it's, it is a little bit sad because the facts are that they not, they're not going to help stop it or slow it. But when families do use it, 
and they see their loved one changing in a positive way, they feel like, oh my gosh, it's going to get better. That's not how Alzheimer's disease works, at least not now, not currently. You do not get better from Alzheimer's disease. Um, if, the, if these meds do work, that's because it's doing its job as far as trying to make you know, changes to the things that cause the symptoms. I mean, making changes to the symptoms. So a lot of times that would be behavior, um, anger, those kinds of things, or repetitiveness. You know, if, if they're slowing down the amount of times they repeat, that means maybe the meds are working, something like that. Now let's talk about that last one there, aducanumab. This is already outdated because in the last two years, we've had some advances as well. If you're reading and if you're watching the news around uh, these treatments and Medicare, there's been a lot of political uh, force behind this because originally these were not covered by Medicare. But let's talk about aducanumab. So aducanumab is the first one that went up for uh, what they call accelerated approval by the Food and Drug Administration. Basically, they're saying, this is cool. Hurry up. Give us some you know, quick approvals. They still have to put it through the actual formal FDA approval. But the fact that we got that quick approval is pretty cool. Now, aducanumab is what they call a disease-modifying treatment versus those other prior ones, which are symptomatic treatments. So when, what I mean by disease modifying treatments is that those plaques and tangles getting stuck, it actually will work on those either by stopping them from getting stuck or from by taking them apart. So that class of drugs, starting with aducanumab, the next one was donanumab, and the last one is lecanumab. So as you can see, there's always a MAB at the end. Um, it stands for monoclonal antibodies, if you wanted to know, but those, those three drugs are actually working on the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease. So again, not just the symptoms, it's actually working on those protein tangles, those, you know, those tangles we talked about earlier. Um, interesting. I feel like when we're getting trained now in the science, you know, typically I don't do the sciencey stuff, but we have to learn this stuff. And it's like, I feel like I went back to biology class because I'm looking at cells and structures. <laughs> and I feel like I probably made a model of this maybe 30 years ago, but in general, it is so interesting to see that with technology, they can see the shape of the proteins getting stuck. Think of it as macaroni. So, you know, there's spaghetti, which is, you know, skinny and long. There is, what is the next salad one? The elbow macaroni. So, you know, sometimes the proteins get hooked together like this. Um, there's that spiral macaroni, right? Some of the, sometimes that's what happens to the, um, to the proteins. And these drugs are pinpointing different shapes even. So like you see in, <coughs> excuse me, in 2014, Memantine is a combination of two different drugs. That's probably what's going to happen with some of these treatments moving forward. But, you know, it is so exciting to see this because this is, this is going to mean a lot for a lot of folks. Now, I am hoping, well, we're being told by our head scientists first that we are going to see the cure in our lifetime, so depending on how old you are. <laughs> I'm not sure. But for me, I'm younger than her, so I'm going to say that I will likely be around when the cure is found. Uh, currently, um, I think one of the biggest challenges to this is access, of course. Um, when you think about these types of medications uh, or these treatments, uh, they are currently, I think that's what that image is up there in that orange circle, it is currently delivered via intravenous um, delivery. Uh, I believe the lecanemab, the current one, is every six months or monthly, uh, where you have to go in, get a shot, um, get hooked up to IV and have an infusion. However, I just found out this morning that they are working on getting it to be subcutaneous, meaning just like any other kind of, you know, shot that you might get, show up and you do a injection. So we're, I mean, it's moving so fast that my slides are going to just be, no sense I make them because it's going to change. But the main thing to know about these, the new ones, those, those disease modifying therapies is that they do have side effects. I think that's one of the things that freak people out the most. Um, I think the most prevalent, or not prevalent, sorry, the most, I guess, scary or concerning would be bleeding in the brain. Uh, you don't want that either. But the way I pose it is this way. And I asked some of my caregivers that I work with, I said, hey, you know what? If you had a drug that, or a treatment that could help your loved one kind of pause or slow down the Alzheimer's, it's not going to, you're still going to, they're still going to live it out and actually get to that end result of you know, Alzheimer's shutting the brain down. But what if we could get it sh that period to be shorter and you have more time with them still knowing you, still being able to engage with you and do things that they want to do? Would it be worth the risk? And most of them said, of course. 
And um, I don't know if any of you have ever observed or have cared for somebody with Alzheimer's disease or other dementia. It's almost like you lose them more than once. I remember this year earlier was the first time my grandma actually forgot who I was. Um, she didn't know my name and she thought I was a real estate, a realtor because she was asking me to sell her house. And, you know, I know that this happens all the time because that's what happens in my work. But to have it done, you know, happen to me was very interesting how I had to stop and think, well, here we are. Um, and when I think about the family saying, you know, we lose them more than once, because once they forget you, it's almost like, who are you? I mean, who is that? Right. And sometimes families describe it as they're just a shell. You know, because even verbally, they can't, they're, they're not the same. Um, they can't talk to you at a certain point. And it's, it is very sad and it's very challenging. So, you know, even though these drugs are not going to be the cure at this point, they are going to, they're intended to make that period where you are, you know, not all there, shorter, if not, um, you know, again, better quality of life. So that is so exciting. Um, there are trials that are available through Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience in Honolulu. They are one of the participating um, sites for clinical trials um, and clinical um, studies. And so I actually know two people from Hawaii Island who go there for their um, injection or their intravenous treatment. Um, I see somebody's hand up. I don't know if you wanna ask your question now. Arlette, did you have a question? No, okay. I think she put her hand up. Okay, <laughs> just checking. All right, so um, that is really where a lot of our focus is. Now, I'm not on the science arm of things, and I can barely pronounce some of those things, but it is really important for us, all of us at the association and all of us in the community to really get to talking about diagnosis. Um, and it starts with those 10 warning signs. I think we went over this the last time we, I met with you folks, but this is a really quick snapshot of the top 10 signs that you see in somebody that could be, again, could be as a keyword, Alzheimer's disease. So I think the first one is pretty uh, obvious. I think most of us understand that memory is, uh, memory challenges is a definite sign of Alzheimer's disease. And as you can kind of see through here, all of these are, of course, things that you would need some executive functioning to do. Um, the main thing again is if you're noticing this in yourself or someone else, that doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's disease. It's very common and I won't be offended or you know surprised if any of you call me after this saying, you know what, number seven looks a little bit like me. You know what, I do that too. And I think it's just a matter of in that first box there, memory, that, memory loss that disrupts your daily life. I mean, I, if I lose my keys, I'm not gonna, you know, it's fine, I'll figure it out. But if I lose them every day, every time that I put them down, that's something else, right? So how does it affect your daily life? The other thing to look at is, is it different from how this person or yourself was before? For example, uh, number three there, difficulty completing familiar tasks. If you are an accountant, well, all of you are attorneys, but if you are an accountant and you were very good at balancing checkbooks and doing numbers and spreadsheets, and all of a sudden you can't keep track of your checkbook and you have bills that are expired, I mean, you know, past due and you, you don't know how to write a check anymore or how to log that entry, but you were always good at that all your life. That is where I'm, that's what I'm talking about. It's something that you probably could have done in the past, but now you're having problems with it. Um, a lot of these two are, could be triggered by changes. You know, I think when people, for example, um, number six, like my grandma spoke Japanese and English growing up. So sometimes we just spoke pigeon in the household and we shouted out whatever came out. But that has to do again with things like, do you know what this is called? Okay, we know this is called a pen, right? But somebody might know that it, what it's for, they might say the thing that I write my name with, but they can't think of the word pen. So that's an example as well. But in general, as you can see here, um, 10 signs, if anything is being noticed, make sure to bring it up with your doctor. I think one of the things that has helped, uh, especially those, well, particularly for those of you, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands, who are of the Medicare age, um, you should be getting a wellness check every year as a part of your Medicare benefits. And part of that, if you are of the upper echelon of the human age bracket, um, you should be getting what they call a screening of a cognitive screening of some sorts. A lot of times it's the remember the three words and repeat them back to me. 
draw the clock. And if you've ever had that, um, that is what that is. It's a very simple test that, uh, that physicians use and nurses use to just kind of test if there's any concern for short-term memory loss or even spatial awareness, um, drawing that clock and putting the hands on there. I'm not sure if anybody has any experience with that, but uh, it is very quick. It's like five minutes and it should be something that they look at. Um, now, of course, if you don't show any signs that maybe are, you know, in your visit with your doctor, if you're not talking about any of this stuff, they might not ask. Okay, so going back to those treatments, the most important thing that makes these treatments the most effective is being diagnosed early on with Alzheimer's disease. Again, if you have a different type of dementia, those new treatments are not, that's not what those are for. So getting a diagnosis, whether it's Alzheimer's or not, is super important. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back really quick. These things here on this 10 warning signs, these are not only caused by Alzheimer's disease. They could be caused by other things. For example, um, one that I've seen in the past, um, things, and it, it doesn't even have to be an extensive you know, disease. It could be things like uh, dehydration. Uh, low, or low blood sugar, I've seen that as well. Hypertension or high blood pressure could cause people to have some of these um, symptoms. Um, sepsis, uh, that could be something as well that looks like this. Uh, problems with medications, I've seen people with side effects that look like this. Um, the thing to think about when it looks, when you're looking at possible Alzheimer's is it happens pretty slowly as far as changes. It's not like you wake up one day, I can't find my keys and I can never, no, it, that, that's probably gonna be something else. Uh, so that's one way to think about it, that it could be something else. And when we go to this next slide, I think that's one of the things that is super helpful. When you're trying to get yourself or somebody to go get that diagnosis, I think people are afraid. And I, I, I would be too, right? I don't wanna to go to the doctor with the potential of them saying, oh gosh, you got Alzheimer's disease. So one of the things that I coach families on is say, well, maybe it's something else because it could be, it very well could be. Um, whether or not it is, we'll leave that up to the physicians, but basically it could be something else. So the easiest way to look at it is if I'm going in because I have one of those signs, maybe I should just check all these other boxes first before I can say, there's some cognitive issues due to Alzheimer's. Um, this little guide here is just really just, to, to, it's a pretty easy tool there, but basically as soon as you know there's something in yourself or someone else, reach out to us or somebody, the doctors, just kind of start that conversation. Um, you know, there are ways to do it. That second box there, develop a plan for finesse. Um, you know, it is not, probably never gonna be easy to tell somebody, you know, I think something's going on with you. but. Honestly, I, I think sometimes people know. Um, some of the clients I've worked with, they actually, if they're early on enough, they actually will say, yeah, you know what? I always forget where I put my shoes. And somehow they're always in the refrigerator. And that one actually happened. I think there were shoes in the refrigerator at one of our clients' houses. But you know, if they can be a part of it, I think it also helps them to get to where they need to go. Again, for yourself, if you are having struggles with, you know, if you're having some of those symptoms and you're struggling with, how to get to that next step, you know, anybody you can talk to. I think the Alzheimer's Association would be a great start. But again, having somebody, you know, having the conversation as soon as possible, think of a way that it's going to look. Um, I'll give you another example for a plan for finesse. I had a family who said, you know, grandma is experiencing these changes and I think we got to tell her. I said, okay. So I kind of talked to them. How do you think you're going to do this? Is it going to be maybe just one child telling them or is there a grandkid that maybe should do this? Or maybe it should be at the doctor's office. And they told me, no, nah, we're going to have a luau and we're going to have a party and be like, grandma, you have some problems and that's okay. <laughs> and we're going to celebrate life. Whatever. I'm not going to judge. You do whatever you need to do. But, you know, just think of the best way to maybe make this a comfortable, or it probably won't be comfortable, but the easiest way for this person to receive information. Take notes about what you see. Document, document, document. You know, when a doctor, when you see a doctor, they either will, this is common, will not talk about it because you never said anything, or the person, the patient that's, you know, has uh, possible Alzheimer's will joke their way through it. Now, typically, like the test I described earlier, that's one way. But sometimes doctors will just use some other questions about spatial awareness of time, space, self. So a good way to look at that is my grandma's 
I'll give you my grandma's example. On one of her visits, she went in and the doctor said, well, what day is it today? And my grandma said, well, must be doctor's appointment day because I'm here, which is not wrong, right? It's not wrong. But the answer she was looking for was, you know, Thursday or, you know, November 1st, whatever it is. But it was not wrong, right? And so it, it becomes this very odd situation where it's like, how do I do this, right? She went on to ask her, well, do you know who I am? And my grandma said, well, you're obviously the doctor. And so, you know, that is common for people to joke their way through or use some kind of tactic to make the doctor think, ah, that's so cute. She's fine. Um, but what's really important is what happens at home. You know, if you're seeing changes and they're not, you know, seeing it or they are just in denial, which is, again, probably what's going to happen. You have to kind of get that information to somebody by taking notes about those changes you've seen. Now, practice in advance, you know how they say, right? Go in the mirror and say, hey, mom, I think I got to talk to you about blah, blah, blah. Do it. Um, it might be, some, it's, it's hard to say those things. Uh, it, for, even for me, you know, I think uh, I would have a hard time with telling if my parents, you know, if that time comes, I will likely have a challenging time. And last there, of course, just think about a way that you can keep it as relaxed and comfortable as possible. Um, I see a question in there. I'm going to look at that. So Scott asks, when observing a, a, a few family members or friends with dementia during some middle stages, I've occasionally seen some anger and or paranoia from the person with dementia. Do you have recommendations on how to deal with it? Yes. I think one of, and that's a perfect segue here. So actually I will get to that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the services that we provide just so that I don't forget. Um, because I think there's so much information that I'm spitting at you from a clinical standpoint, from just, you know, home life, taking notes, going to the doctor, having a luau, whatever it is, it's, it's very overwhelming when this happens. Uh, you know, when I think back to my grandfather's diagnosis in the 90s, you know, my grandma took the, took the whole point of, well, she's Japanese. So yeah, I think culturally it was like, no, nope, we are not doing this. Nothing's wrong. This is just how he is. He's a grouchy old husband. This is how he is, which no, Right, that's not what was happening. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And um, we never reached out. It was just like, okay, well, I guess we're going to struggle and suffer along the way. And that is so common, especially here. It's, it's like the shame or the guilt or just the misunderstanding. So that's why it's really important, no matter what, even if there's nothing to worry about, ask somebody. Um, like I said earlier, it is not uncommon for me to go through those 10 warning signs and have somebody email me or call me saying, you know what? Oh, I don't know. I, I I cannot find my car in Walmart. Me neither. That, that parking lot is a mess. But, you know, it's, it's good to got, kind of think about that. Um, you know, in my time in this field, I, I hear more often than not, some of my clients talk very freely about, oh, how's your A1C today? Oh, mine's is pretty high. You know, okay, well, mine's is pretty good. Okay, cool. What's your, you know, what's your blood pressure? Very similar. Like we want it to be where brain health is normalized. Like those types of situations with your heart, uh, your blood sugar, uh, weight even. I mean, people talk about weight and losing weight and diet and eating healthier. You know, our hope is that, you know, brain health will be very similar. But let's go through these really quickly as far as the types of services we provide. Um, the first one is care consultation. I think one thing that I tell people is even though we can teach, you know, about Alzheimer's disease, what it is, you know, what typically happens, everybody's experience is going to be a little bit different. Okay. Um, there's no A, B, C, D, step one, step two. It's going to be different for everybody. You know, my grandpa was pretty nice and friendly. My grandma was the easiest way to think about it. And I'm just giving this to you as a very clean, I mean, as a very obvious depiction. Uh, if you remember the movie Exorcist, um, and when the girl is possessed and she's flopping around screaming, that is how my grandmother was. So very stark difference between my grandma and my grandfather, same diagnosis, but the way that their brains and bodies are reacting and you know showing those symptoms, very, very different. So it is gonna be different for everybody. So care consultations are one-on-one, -on -one, or I've also done uh, group sessions with families. You know, Sometimes they wanna have all the kids together to say, hey, let's talk about dad, and we're noticing some things. But a care consultation is very much personalized to what you need, um, you know, I think, not just about the disease, but about care options, about care homes. I mean, one of the questions I get often is, how do I know when it's time to place them in a care home? Or where are the care homes? How much do they cost? Who pays for that? So anything having to do with your situation, 
one-on-one -on -one care consultation is the way we can do it on via phone or or via zoom uh, sometimes zoom, zoom is helpful for those group calls as well uh, but other things too so this slide here actually talks about the care consultations aside from myself our 24 7 helpline that i'll talk about in a little bit is what this is talking about but because you folks know me or know that there is a local chapter you can get care consultations from one of us uh, the main reason why i think that that's helpful especially for example for my my island i know my resources and my services better than say oahu's so having somebody who lives here or maybe their loved one lives here talk to me specifically makes sense uh, but any in any case you can always start with our care consultation either my colleagues here in hawaii or um, on the helpline that i'll talk about in a bit information and referral very similar a lot of times people just want to know when the next class is or do i know if there's a support group uh, you can call us for simple things like that as well caregiver support group so this is um common but often one of the scarier things that people don't like to do because it's you're being vulnerable right when you're going to a group saying i am a caregiver for my mom and she has alzheimer's it is very challenging for sometimes sometimes for people to say something like that so caregiver support group stars are not meant to be like a therapy where you we're going to have clinical notes and you know you can go to your doctor no it is very much peer led in a sense of the topic um, my topics can range from just yesterday we had a group that their question was my husband has stopped has stopped eating do i know when when do i know to let him go wow that's pretty deep right a couple months ago, the topic was, where is the best poke on Hawaii Island? And that is literally what they talked about for 30 minutes. Now, it sounds very much like that would be unhelpful, right? Like, what kind of caregiver support group is that? But that day, we had a brand new person show up, and she actually emailed me and said, you know what? I love talking about the best poke on the island because it wasn't about my mom and caregiving, and it, it took me away from the stresses of my life. So the caregiver support group is really meant to be a lot more organic. It is not where I have a list of questions or, you know, I don't have like a chart saying, okay, we're going to go through these 10 bullet points. It is very free flowing, really guided by what the folks have as a topic. Um, a lot of times I fo we focus on things like, what are you winning at today as a caregiver? Are you, what, what, what's something you did really well as a caregiver this week? Or also, what is something you're struggling with? So these are really cool. Uh, typically they're around five, six is probably the biggest. Um, we have, for example, here on Hawaii Island, I, have, I run two that are virtual every month. We have one in person in Waimea at Tutu's house and we have one in Hilo at the Office of Aging, um, the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Uh, our website, alz.org forward slash Hawaii, you can look for the ones on your island. So they're all listed there. Education and training. So, you know, I took some snippets from some of our programs today to show you some of those slides, but we do have typical um, 16 or so core education classes. For example, that 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's is an actual hour presentation where we walk through some of the things uh, through all of those, those um, symptoms and we look at it versus a typical age related change. Because remember, Alzheimer's disease is not a normal part of aging. You have to actually have a diagnosis. Not everybody gets Alzheimer's disease. So um, this is helpful because a lot of times people just want to get the information and sit with it. Uh, you know, often I make the offer saying, hey, thanks for coming to class. Give me a call or reach out to our helpline, get that consultation and start thinking about ways to move forward. But sometimes people just want to hear the information and just hold it, look at it, review it. I've had people come to the same class again and again, and that's okay. Um, this is also helpful for um, our providers out there or businesses who just want to learn about ways they can better support their customers. Um, I used to work at a credit union back in the day, and I remember having at least two cases where the person had dementia of some sort, and we had to work at it. And the tellers were like, what the heck do we do? It, people are out there in the community with Alzheimer's and dementia, right? So a lot of the education might seem like it's good for caregivers and families of those caring for people with Alzheimer's, but no, it is also for people out there in the community who just want to know a little bit when they have to help somebody. Okay, so like I was saying, the 24-7 helpline, literally every day of the year, uh, they never stop. I mean, they 
they do, but you know, it's it's not okay. I should remember your attorneys. No, we do not breach any kind of labor laws. Um, but there, there's always going to be someone there on that helpline. There are master's level clinicians, meaning kind of like therapist types, where they can answer anything about some of the things we talked about today. You know, if you're noticing signs, you know, if you have a question, what is Alzheimer's? What is dementia? Or I've had this as well, where you know what? I've been up for so long caring for my husband. I can't do it anymore. I'm gonna like go nuts or jump out this window. And that actually was something a, a caregiver told me. So, you know, it's, 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 it, they're ready for pretty much everything. Um, even if it's something emergency, they, are, they can connect you to, you know, those resources as well. But that's a great place to start uh, because you guys know that there is an Aloha chapter and you guys know that I exist. Um, if you're on Hawaii Island, you know, you can reach out to us locally as well. Um, online, alz.org, tons and tons of things on there. Uh, you know, really just a lot of information for some people, it's overwhelming, but there are people who just like to kind of browse and look at it without having to interact with people, go at it. Um, you actually can find some of our education programs on there as well. That last one there, the CRF stands for Community Resource Finder. It is a partnership with AARP. And uh, basically it's looking for any kind of resources in your community, not just from us, but things like where's the adult daycare in my area or where are some of the resources for transportation? I will say the Hawaii Island ones are not as updated as my brain because I work in this field. So, but feel free to browse it. And I'll end with this story. So my grandmother got diagnosed maybe I'm going to say seven years ago, and I remember the only time that we had to talk to her about this, or at least me, I don't know about like my mom folks or any other family members, she brought me that paper that comes from the doctors, you know, the one that they, 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 they now give you like a whole packet of things to read about your condition and your meds, and it's like, you know, it looks like a dissertation in itself, and she saw the word um, dementia. So she brings it to me, and she was still very, you know, high functioning, she was still driving and doing things. Um, and she said, do I have dementia? And I knew she was showing signs at the time, you know, and um, I was, I had just started working at the Office of Aging, or well, I wasn't there that long when this came up. And she was like, well, I said, well, you know, do you think you do? And she's like, I don't know. I was like, well, it looks like the doctor says you do. So let's just go with it. And that is the only time we've talked about the diagnosis. Unfortunately, she doesn't know she has it. Um, she never went through the workup to actually find out if she has Alzheimer's specifically. So she's living with dementia. We know it's probably Alzheimer's type, but you know, she didn't remember me this day. She knew me by my Hawaiian name, which is cool. Um, she named me. So that was nice, but um, you know, she's 99 and that's bonus years at this point. So, you know, we're just happy that we could bring her out. She does live in a nursing facility, um, but she's one of the statistics where even though she might've wanted to know she had Alzheimer's, she never found out for sure. We know she doesn't. So, but with that, I want to say thank you for your time. Um, I'm open to, oh, let's go through some of the questions. If Scott, if we have time to do those. Yeah. Um. So Nick, we have a question in the chat. Uh, is there any evidence that hearing problems uh, execrate uh, uh, Alzheimer's? Great question. Okay, let's do that one first. So yes, that is a great question. So when you think about the way that Alzheimer's affects your brain, um, Typically, memory goes first and then behavior changes, but it eventually affects your senses. Now, when somebody has Alzheimer's, the sense that they lose or the communications method they use usually lose first is verbal. So being able to converse with you, that usually will be struggling first. So instead of talking to you, they'll use other things. When hearing is, when hearing is an issue, it already, you know, if they're already struggling with taking in information, verb, audio, and trying to respond verbally, hearing does not help if that is gone. So that's, my grandma's the same way. She doesn't have hearing loss in the sense that her ears are damaged. She, her brain doesn't know how to translate sound, I think. That's my unscientific way. The reason I know that, or I think that, is because she can hear us sometimes and sometimes not at all. And so it, it's not like her ear is broken. There is just something in translation. So it does, anytime somebody's missing or has a, another sense that is dulled for some reason, vision, just like vision, they already are losing more of their ability to communicate. So definitely, I would say, yeah, in that case, it, it doesn't maybe exacerbate it, but it does make it difficult for them to communicate. And I think that's where you see the behavior changes even more so. So hope that answered that question. 
any more that I see except for the uh, Desmond? You want to go through the? Should we go through the ones in the Q and A? Um. Uh, uh, the first question, I believe you already answered. Okay. And then, okay. Yeah. And then. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I didn't answer specifically, but yes. Um, when somebody, so again, the question was about you know occasionally seeing some anger and paranoia from the person with dementia. Recommend recommendations. I think one of the biggest things that you can learn how to do, or one of the biggest things, is learn how to lie and be okay with it. Some families won't do it because they feel guilty, but you know what? What you're doing is you're changing the rules. The rules and the goals change when somebody has dementia. The rule is not being correct. The rule is not being right. The rule is not fixing. The rule is let's have a happy moment every moment we have. So for example, my grandma always, did you sell my house? We did it. We own it. And she wants to sell it, but we just tell her, yeah, 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 done. And that ends it versus we told you again for the 30th time, we, so, we still have it because that'll just trigger her into, well, sell it because I want the money. So you got to weigh that out, right? I think that's one of the biggest recommendations I have when somebody is doing that is getting into their world, thinking, okay, what's triggering them? Can I figure out an answer or a response that does not continue this behavior? And it can be as simple as making something up. Again, safety first though. I mean, don't, you know, don't do crazy. Don't do, don't get too crazy and let them, you know, jump off the building. Cause I, can I fly? No, you cannot fly. You know, so again, safety first, but yeah, that's probably one of my biggest um, recommendations for dealing with behavior. Just figure out a way to nip it. Might not be real, but that's okay. Okay. Any other questions we got? Quiet looks group. Like, <laughs> looks like there hasn't been any um, new questions okay. in the, um, in the chat uh, in the Q&A box. So um, I guess we can um, end a little early today. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Nick, for giving your presentation. And I'm going to pass it over to um, Scott Spelina, who will do his closing remarks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nick, thank you for your presentation. It's most helpful. Um, I just want to add on to, if I can, uh, my father in his later years, um, right before he passed, suffered from Alzheimer's. And I can understand a lot of what you were saying. Uh, my father's paranoia was not having enough money. And so he would like be at in the middle of the night, one o'clock in the morning, going through his desk. Wanting, he wanted an exact penny that he had in his bank account. He wanted my mom to call the accountant and say, do we have enough money? Do we have enough money? How much money do you have in your pockets? How much money do you have? To where it became like we had to placate him and say, we have enough. I have a hundred dollars. I have this much. I have, we have plenty, plenty, plenty money just to, again, find that moment of peace because he is so paranoid towards the end. Um, also my question about uh, hearing, um, thank you for answering that. And that also last couple of years um, before he passed, he had a difficult time hearing and yet he see people speaking to each other and he felt very paranoid that they're talking about him or he wanted to say, What's what do you mean? What's going on? What's going on? And so we had to make an effort to include him in any conversation and make sure they could hear if he refused to go to Costco for the hearing aid, he refused to go to those places because he didn't think he had a hearing problem. Um, and yet he was becoming more and more isolated because he did not address his hearing problem. And so that was frustrating to some extent, but we just had to be more patient with him and make sure he understood what was going on. Take that extra effort to explain where, um, what was going on again for that peaceful moment. And lastly, I want to chime in and um, join you in um, the value of these caregiver support groups and that caregiver stress is very real. And a lot of people don't understand that um, caring for somebody with Alzheimer's dementia is not a job, it's a lifestyle. A job you can leave, a job you can go home at night, um, a job you can um, just take a break from a vacation from. But when you're a caregiver and oftentimes Families are caregivers 24 seven. They live with their parents um, and they see that. It takes a toll, it takes a very real toll. The stress level, you just learn to live with, but it gets worse and worse and worse to where I always encourage people finding themselves in that um, caregiving situation to find some sort of outlet to go to these caregiver support groups and maybe finding, uh, talking to somebody that um, about the pokey, where's the best place to get a pokey bowl? Um, because they don't need to be, they live with Alzheimer's day and night. It's constantly on there. So they need a break. They need to go to the movie. They need to go to a dinner. They need to take care of themselves because they may not understand that they are under this weight of being a caregiver. And they don't understand until they take a break from it um, through going through a support group or whatever, 
that there's a tremendous burden on caregivers that a lot of them don't appreciate. And then one day they snap. And unfortunately, in my line of work, I've seen some of the times where people have snapped and made decisions that they can never take back. So caregiver stress is very real. So I'm glad that you answered that question there. Um, any last remarks, Nick, um, before we end the meeting here? Um, we did get a few more questions. So Desmond, if you want to go through those, okay. happy to do those. Okay. Um, so these two questions are actually from the same person. Is it, uh, uh, is it important that I walk many days and should I use better food? Okay. That's great. Uh, you know, a lot of emphasis now because we are trying to get you not just looking at treatments, we're looking at how do we get the best of our life? What can we do lifestyle wise? So there are four things that are obvious. Now, the first one is going to be very obvious. Guess what it is? Diet. <laughs> so plant-based diet um, is the way to go. Some diets you can take a look at are med the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. The DASH diet was originally developed for hypertension or high blood pressure. And basically what's good for your heart is good for your brain. That's the easiest way to think about it. So uh, food, yes. And as far as walking, physical activity is the second thing that will help you keep that risk as low as possible, at least in terms of what you can do. Uh, the two others are socialization, uh, you know, meaningful socialization. I think that's why, like Scott was saying, that the conversation, even though maybe they don't get it all, keep them in there, right, as much as possible. Uh, so conversation, uh, socialization, and the last one is actually brain, brain exercises. So, you know, that could mean very many, I mean, people say, well, I play Candy Crush on my phone. Not I mean, there has to be some challenge to your brain. So things like doing puzzles, um, reading. A, okay, so if you are, let's say you're very much into football and that's all you read about. If you read about something other than football, even something as simple as that can help you. But what it's doing is building new brain connections or they call it cognitive reserves because it's something you never had to talk about or think about before. So your brain is having to build some, you know, <clears throat> muscle in there. Uh, they did a study that folks who are folks who have more uh, formal education, you know, degrees, or or just formal going to formal classes like senior centers have a lower risk as well. So that is my excuse for spending all this money to get my doctorate. I'm going to say, <laughs> oh no, I'm saving my brain. Um, so those are the four areas that you really can make a difference or you know work towards as far as prevention. So, great question. And then I think last question here is, um, are those with significant dementia better off in care homes or family residents? Uh, got it. So better off is going to be something that you guys determine as a family. I know some families who will not consider that, and that is their choice. And that's okay. If that's what you're going to do, whether you it's easier. I mean, I don't think it's going to be easy, but some families will go through that experience because they want to, because whatever, that's their cultural choice or that's just what their belief is. Fine. I just tell families know that that is not the only way you can, of course, place somebody. The reason I would say better off would be around safety and not just safety for the person with dementia, but for the family member too. When I go back to that story, I told you earlier about this guy it's like come on we were trying to get him to just reach out he wouldn't and look what happened so in general it's it has to do with safety it has to do with burnout uh it is never easy for the most part when you do have to look at a care home i don't think i've ever had a family member go yay a care home no it's gonna be a beef it's gonna be tough but i think scott had pointed out to this uh pointed out something similar where once you do it though and you realize how it benefits them and you it's okay. My mom took a long time when she placed my grandma, you know, for medical reasons, she was just a danger to herself and others. She was, it was guilty. Like she was like, we're going to take her out. I cannot, that's terrible. How terrible, what kind of daughter am I? And I'm like, well, you know, there's Alzheimer's association help. Did she show up? No, but I watched her go through that naturally. And she's, she realized, wow, I'm so much healthier. I go exercise. I see my friends and, and she's, she's way off. She's better because I can't do the meds. That's something I literally can't do at home. So, you know, it, it really depends. It's going to be a family centric family. A lot of times it is a family decision to make. Yeah. And if I can jump in Nicholas on that um, also, they have to be realistic in what kind of care they yeah. can give it yeah. because a lot of people they go shopping at uh, these facilities and look at the price tags. Oh no, we can't afford that. Let's be parquet and try to do it at yeah. home. And then okay, you're the youngest daughter. You take care of the responsibility, and then the other siblings go about their lives. 
not realizing that is a huge responsibility, a huge stress on this sibling that's been volunteered or voluntold to be the caregiver. Right. Um, there's actually the uh, Mediation Center of the Pacific. They have a Kapuna Pono program, right. yep. which helps families in deciding um, who to be the caregiver, how to handle caregiving opportunities like that. Um, because you just have to be realistic and don't be uh, right. paquet and saying, oh, well, let's save some money and um, we'll drop off some plate lunches every other week or whatever <laughs> and right. do it like right. that. Um, right. Because it is a huge, I don't want to say a burden, but a huge responsibility on the sibling that ends up being at home. Yes. Um, so you have to be just realistic and have open uh, communication amongst all the family members. If, if we're going to go down this road of being at home by themselves, um, or being at home, <clears throat> caring for them at home, excuse me, um, you have to be realistic about that. Right. And, you know, sometimes there's the, there's the, 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 the rah, 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 but then when you have to change your parents' diaper for the first time, there goes the rah, 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 right? So it's, again, even learning about what that looks like uh, it is helpful before you make the decision. I think the hard thing about things like care homes, I mean, it's hard to plan for those things because you might not need it. But um, at a recent AARP, and I think this is going to be something they're doing statewide, they're doing an aging in place planning uh, session where they're trying to get you to think about, okay, maybe not now, but just know these things exist and these questions will probably come up for you. What do you want, right? Um, we're familiar with things like planning for health, advanced healthcare directives, right? Do I want life, life sustaining support or not? But very similarly, it's like, would you want to be in a skilled nursing facility and when? It's almost like a when question not an if, because for the most part, even if families try so hard, I think almost always, unless the person is very docile, will need to have some kind of intervention outside of the home. I, I don't think, I rarely see somebody live their entire life out at home. I'm not saying it can't be done, and it's, but my great grandma was that way, but we look back at how our family was treating her, we, were, we knew that that was basically what you were saying, Scott, right? It's like they did the bare minimum, if not almost not enough, just to keep her at home, right? But she could have done so much better if she had access or if they, you know, put her in a home or something else. And she had the money too. And it's just, the dynamics around this is so intense. And that's why those care consultations are so helpful to do that one-on-one. -on -one. So, but thanks for sharing all of your stories too, Scott. Yeah, I think it helps people. I mean, a lot of people think when they think of the future is that I'll live to be 100 years old and die in my sleep, perfectly healthy, <laughs> but they die instantly, not realizing that there's a decline in their lifestyle as they get older. Um, the doctor visits increase, the medication increases, your cognitive ability decreases, your health decreases. And so um, I agree with you 100%. It's not an if, it's more a when these days. Exactly. And they're not comfortable to talk about. I think that's the challenge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Nicholas, for everything. Of course, thank um, you for having me. Any more questions, um, or we're going to go ahead and wrap this up? Yeah, you can um, give your closing remarks again. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Uh, again, I want to thank Nicholas. Um, one thing in his presentation, there's a couple of slides that I said, oh, I want to ask him for that. But then I realized that these presentations are all on YouTube. Um, so give us a couple of days to uh, get this uploaded to YouTube. All our... Um, Senior Council Division um, coffee hours that you just witnessed are uploaded on YouTube. I'm not saying that just because I have a couple up there myself, but also because um, it's good information. And it's, especially in this kind of presentation, um, if you're going to be experiencing this, this might be something you might want to share with your siblings if you have a parent that's going down that road. Um, this is information that is going to be relevant um, for the rest of your life and and even though medications change and treatments change, just like that one slide with the different um, symptoms and like, are you this, 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 or this? It's like, I'm going to refer to that saying, okay, oh, I'm losing this. I have this, or this person I know has this, that, or the other. So it's very important. Um, I want to wish everybody for tuning in today. Um, this is the last uh, coffee talk we have um, for this year, 2023, um, from the Senior Council Division. But join us um, after the new year. Everybody have a safe and happy new year. We'll be back and we'll be stronger than ever. And we'll have a um, whole list of experts like Nicholas um, sharing what they know um, and their expertise. And again, thank you everybody for tuning in today and have a happy and safe holiday season coming up. Thank you very much. Aloha.